My name is Seth Lloyd. I'm a professor of auto mechanical engineering and of physics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, would you like us to give us a, just a small sneak preview of what your lecture is going to be about today, or would you like to keep that secret? Well, I was a bit surprised to see that the topic is quantum computing in society and the universe. I don't recall having given that <laughs> as a name, so it sounds rather broad, but I, I'm going to talk rather specifically about quantum machine learning, which is the application of quantum computing to finding patterns in data. Mm -hmm. So is, would quantum computing completely revolutionize that area? It has the potential to. I, I, I'm not going to make any predictions about whether it will or not, because for it to happen you have to build a pretty large-scale quantum computer to make it happen. But yes, it, it does have the potential for doing that. I mean, machine learning is a very trendy topic these days, and, and uh, uh, because places like you know, Google and Amazon and Microsoft and Apple use it to spy on us and analyze all of our data until they know more about us than we actually know ourselves, for better or worse. Uh, and um, it involves taking very large amounts of data and uh, feeding it into a computer and trying to find patterns in that data by a wide variety of different mechanisms. So, um, you know, traditional forms of data analysis, um, like curve fitting, and, uh, but then also deep learning, which um, involves uh, uh, models of computation that are based on the way that the brain works, neural models of computation. And basically people are trying a wide variety of different methods for analyzing data classically. And it turns out that for, for a lot of these methods, quantum computers could provide a huge speed up uh, um, over classical methods. And it would be able to find patterns in data that a classical computer can never find. So do we have any, do you have any idea of how that might impact society when these kind of methods of machine learning become feasible? Um, well, uh, so machine learning is already having a lot of impact on society. I mean, the, there are some very nice applications of machine learning that people use. So for example, voice recognition, the idea of making software that could recognize what people are saying and merely, you know, transform what spoken words into written words uh, is a very powerful technology. People have been trying to do this for decades, but uh, not with much success. I mean, back in around 2000, MIT, where I work, replaced its human operators, telephone operators, with computerized telephone operators. And then for several years after that, you'd call up and this computerized voice say, who would you like to speak with? And I'd say, I would like to speak with Professor Jane Smith. And then the voice would say, now ringing Mary left pants. <laughs> if this is not the right number person, please press 9. <laughs> Jane Smith, <clears throat> now ringing Hua Zhang. <laughs> you know, we went on that for, for you know, many years. But somehow, just in the last few years, I'd say, in fact, I would put in the last two years or so, Voice recognition software has gotten a lot better, and the reason is that the computers are much more powerful, and they have much larger data sets to work on, and they're capable of adapting to each individual's vocal patterns and habits of speech. And as a result, now, voice recognition software is actually good. It's amazing how well it does. And that's a classic problem of machine learning that people have been working on for decades, which just recently has uh, worked much better than it did before. And that's a very positive thing. Um, quantum computers, uh, uh, maybe you don't need them for voice recognition, but they would be very powerful for analyzing really huge data sets. So like, say, take a data set, suppose we had a data set that consisted of all the genomes of all the human beings on the planet. So, you know, this is each, your, each person's gene, genome has uh, around 10 billion bits of information in it. And then if they're around, you know, in a few years, there'll be around 10 billion people on the planet. God help us. And um, so now we're talking 20 billion bits of information, and that's a lot of information. And it's very hard to do even the simplest kinds of mathematical manipulations of those large data sets. But quantum computers could do that very effectively. And so find patterns that you might not be able to find. For instance, the way that genes interact with each other and turn each other on and off. Uh, correlations between um, uh, uh, G 
genes from people from different kind of countries or within the same country or, or a genetic group. Um, uh, and so that could, could be very useful. I mean, it also could be, you know, when, when one talks about things like this, it gets kind of scary, right? I'm not sure I want my, as an American, I'm not sure I want my insurance company to have access to my genome. And quantum computers also provide intrinsic privacy to uh, this kind of um, analysis. So you could analyze such a data set to find patterns without ever having access to anybody's individual genome. So that actually is kind of nice. That is, if they provide, quantum computers could provide ways of analyzing very large amounts of data. Uh, at the same time, they could provide a guarantee to individuals whose data is being analyzed that they still possess privacy, or as I would they say in England, privacy. <laughs> <laughs> Science develops as our as the limits of measurement develop. Mm. That, that's sort of yeah. been our, our impression when we've been learning, and particularly that seems particularly apparent in quantum physics. Absolutely. Um, so we're just wondering if you might like to talk about that. A little bit. Oh yes, I could probably go on for a far longer than you'd <laughs> like on that because I, you know, <laughs> uh, my colleagues, the Torch of Anetti and Lorenzo McClone and I wrote a whole series of papers that just kind of like nail down what the quantum limits to measurement okay. are. That would be interesting. And uh, so. uh, because. It, you know, for precision measurement, let, let's take, for example, uh, quantum clocks, which are the atomic clocks are the most precise measuring instruments that human beings have ever constructed. And they're tremendously precise, and they can mark out time to an accuracy in one part in 10 to the 18th, right? So, or depending on your metric, but it, it's, they're tremendously accurate. And um, for years, <coughs> for years, the most accurate atomic clock was Dave Wineland's, Dave Wineland's quantum logic quantum clock, which was cited in his Nobel Prize uh, uh, citation. And, and uh, it, it explicitly uses methods from quantum information processing to make the clock more accurate. And this is not an accident because, in fact, if you look at precision measurement, you're making things as extreme and precise as you can, and, and such extreme precise things are all governed by the laws of quantum mechanics. So the ultimate limits to measurement are governed by quantum mechanics, and um, and to uh, reach those limits, you need to use funky quantum effects like you know, squeezed light and entanglement. Um, but there's been a huge amount of progress in, in precision measurement over the years, and in fact, many things that people think of, for example, Moore's law, that people think of as you know this not a law of nature, though it's just a law of technological progress that computers have gotten faster every couple, of, uh, doubled in speed every couple of years. Moore's law actually relies at bottom on a whole bunch of mini Moore's laws for precision measurement, fabrication, quantum control at the very small levels. So they're really driven <coughs> by, at some level, by metrology and by quantum metrology. So these advances in making more precise measurements translate directly into technological advances like making more powerful and faster computers because it allows you to miniaturize the components of computers at this exponential rate. So at a very profound technological level, um, the, uh, the physics of measurement, in particular the quantum mechanics of measurement, have uh, a, uh, a deep effect uh, on um, human society. One of the most famous sort of limits that people actually are kind of aware of in terms of limits of measurement um, from quantum physics is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Yes, I'm sorry? Heisenberg uncertainty yes. principle. Yeah, yeah. Can you um, tell us a bit about what that is and also whether it has impacts in sort of now we're starting to deal with quantum systems, if that has impacts on how you actually build or observe or, or you know, take measurements from quantum systems? Yeah, so the, the, um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says you, know, you can either measure how fast something is going or where it is, but you can't measure both at the same time. And uh, that if the measurement were to yield an exact position, then it must be uncertain in how fast you're going, as in the, you know, the famous physics joke, the cop pulls Heisenberg over and says, Professor Heisenberg, do you know how fast you were going? And he said, no, but I know exactly where I am. <laughs> <laughs> and 
<laughs> or, or, or the other version of it where the cop calls Heisenberg over and said, Professor Heisenberg, do you know that you're going exactly 95.3 miles per hour? And he says, gosh darn it, now I don't know where I am. <laughs> I'm lost. So. <laughs> do, does, it have, um, does it have an impact on, on quantum systems that now people are trying to build? And, and, of course. And, yeah. and, how do, and how does that limit what you can do? as far as understanding what's happening inside a quantum system, or what, what are people trying to do to get around those problems? Well, it's not something to get around with. I think, you know, quantum mechanics in general, it's weird and counterintuitive, and you just got to suck it up. You know, that's just life, right? Einstein hated that. It was counterintuitive, and Einstein trusted his intuition. He's Einstein, and said, you know, it can't be right. But for people like me, whose intuition is usually wrong, it's fine, right? I, I'm okay with it being counterintuitive. So it's, it's not a bug, it's a feature that there are fundamental quantum limits to how accurately you can measure things you can't measure. There are, are different observables which you cannot measure simultaneously. Um, and if you measure one thing, you'll mess up the measurement of another thing. That's just life. And um, in some sense, it, it, they, these uh, features come together in this theory of measurement and observation because they tell us how accurately, not only they tell us that there are limits to how accurately we can measure things, but they tell us how to achieve those limits, which if we didn't know about it, if we tried to ignore it, we wouldn't get anywhere. So it's actually rather an important thing to, not merely to, you know, you, you don't have to just suck it up, you can you know, try to understand what's going on and to, uh, to use that to, to make more precise measurements. And also to, to understand really the nature of, of observation of our universe, that you know, one of the largest outstanding questions that has un remained unresolved for a hundred years in quantum mechanics is trying to reconcile quantum mechanics with Einstein's theory of general relativity. And um, uh, it seems to be very hard to do that. And, but but you know, general relativity, Einstein phrased the notions of general relativity in terms of what are the observations we can make about the universe. You know, suppose that we have people who are an observer who's moving at a particular speed with respect to another observer, how do they construct their own picture of events. And this intrinsically appeals to the notion of, a, of an observer. And we, I feel that we can't, we will never understand how to reconcile quantum mechanics with general relativity unless we take into account the quantum mechanical nature of the observers that are constructing the universe and the geometry of the universe out of their observation. There was one other question connected to what you were talking about before. We now have these massive data sets yeah. and we sort of set um, machine learning algorithms on them. So is the nature of observation changing in that sense as well? We used, we're used to the idea of observation being a sort of a physical observation or you're observing a physical event. Are we now moving to a point where we have to get a, a sort of a sense of what observation means when you're now working on sort of data sets from, that aren't from physical kind of systems? Well, the, it, it turns out that when you have very large data sets and attack them using very powerful computers to find patterns, first of all, you can find patterns that people could never have found um, even five years ago, as the example of voice recognition software shows. Uh, but there is actually a, a rather profound difference. I mean, if you, let's consider the, the compare you know, one of the early uses of computers for analyzing data, such as curve fitting. You know, you have some data and you want to fit a smooth curve that minimizes the error for, for this data. And what you end up with is a curve and the computer will tell you, here's the formula for this curve and here's how I calculated it and here's a guarantee that it will actually fit the data in some best way. I mean, this makes perfect sense. And these basic methods have been known since, you know, since the Laplace and the, and the 18th century. And, and uh, uh, when you computerize it, it becomes more powerful, but you still know what's going on. Whereas if you take a, you know, a deep neural network and you, you train it to recognize patterns of you know, photos of kittens on the internet, as a famous project happened. By the way, you know, I'm not so impressed by this because if you just take a kind of Bayesian perspective and say, yeah, I, someone hands me a photo uh, from the internet, I don't even look at it and I say, it's a kitten, right? You know, it's already like, you know, 75% chance. The prior probability of a photo from the internet being a kitten is already very, very high. So I'm not sure why this is an impressive thing. <laughs> 
So, I mean, you know, the way this works, you give, give the computer a gajillion photos of kittens, and then you adjust the weights, which are these, you know, weights of these artificial neurons to try to recognize and distinguish between kitten photos and other photos. In the end, it does really well, but why? You have no idea. Mm. The model is now this set of weights, you know, a billion weights in some artificial neural network, and you don't know any more about what it's doing or how it's distinguishing, the computer's distinguishing kitten photos than you do about how human beings distinguish kittens. It might even be easier in case of human beings there's like a kitten neuron that fires when you mm. know, it sees a kitten. Ooh, mm -hmm. cute! I think there is one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, that must be one so there is a difference then between, that there, there is a very fundamental difference then between understanding and recognizing patterns. So I think, yeah. we're not yeah. anywhere near, with this machine learning approach, we're not getting anywhere near intelligence. Uh, you know, one of the features of intelligence, human intelligence, is that it's kind of inscrutable. Right? Mm. That is often one doesn't know how, usually, one doesn't know how other human beings are thinking and what's mm. going on. Anybody who's ever been in a relationship knows that. So, in some sense, computers, by being able, are both getting more powerful and are performing tasks that are um, that human beings were only able to perform before. Moreover, they're doing it in a way that you know is like human beings, and that they're intrinsically inscrutable in their way of doing it. I, when I talk with my colleagues at MIT and brain and cognitive sciences, they are completely unconcerned about computers any time, you know, coming anywhere close to human intelligence because. One of the main lessons over the last 20 years of analyzing the brain is that the brain is much more complicated and varied than people have thought before. There are many more parts with many more specialized purposes. The ways in which they talk to each other are not known. But actually, you know, the, back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, people said, well, we'll just build a sufficiently large, undifferentiated neural network, and then it will become intelligent. And what people did is they did build, you know, in the last few years, they built very large undifferentiated neural networks, and they are capable of recognizing photos of kittens on the internet. But they don't seem so far to be able to go, you know, do the vast majority of things, other things that human beings do. So I'm not personally too worried about that. Any more than I'm worried about, you know, computers banding together and taking, <laughs> taking over, taking over society. I think it's a misplaced worry. <laughs>